multiply, multiply everything that you have given. This morning, I um, am happy to invite my dad to share a word this morning. You guys, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. Chris alluded to it. We, before, dad, as you come, I think we should pray just as a body. Can you stand again? Um, You can come, you can jump in and pray too, but good Lord, there's a lot happening on the earth. The earth is groaning. We talked about this last week. Chris just said this. This is not the time to freak out. If God tells you to get a bunker and that's how he wants you to live, I guess do it. I would probably question it personally, but this is the time to rise and shine. For your light has come. These are the days that we've been waiting for. Not for chaos, but this is the days that the church, it's like he's building his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is empowering each and every one of you as powerful sons and daughters to be change on the earth, to bring his kingdom. When we say his kingdom is breaking through, it is the coming upon, but it's also the breaking through through you. And this is how he does it. And so, Lord, right now we just pray for the earth that is groaning, that is crying out for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed, for this clashing and colliding of kingdoms, Lord. And we thank you that you rule and reign. We have seen the end of the story. We even sang this morning, you are Alpha and you are Omega. You are the beginning of the story and you are the end. And you have everything in between in your sight, Lord. You're not surprised by any of this. But Lord, we pray right now for peace in Israel. Lord, we pray that the apple of your eye, Lord, that you would sustain her, you would protect her, you promised that you would be with her. And so, Lord, we come into agreement with that um, declaration that you've made over this nation. We pray for Israel. Lord, they've been in such a pressure box for so many years, but right now, it seems like all the bad guys are looking at them with ill intent, and it's so much bigger than even Israel. God, we pray for wisdom for our nation's leaders. We pray for wisdom, God. We pray for strength. We pray for courage in these days. We pray for the mind of Christ. We pray, God, that you would not allow anything to happen outside of your timing. But Lord, we trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. You are a good father. You have good plans in store. We are not those that run in fear. But Lord, we stand firm. Thank you, God, that you always lead us into victory. You always lead us into triumph. That's who you are, and we pray that for your people here in America. We pray that for your people all over the earth, and especially right now in the Middle East, God. Put your hand of protection on her. Cover her, Lord. Every missile and fiery dart, we pray Psalms 91 right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Please welcome my father, your friend, the great, the honorable, Bishop Klein, the right reverend. Wow, how auspicious. (laughs) Thank you. Boy, we really do need to keep Israel in our prayers, don't we? Um, Iran is actually threatening to attack them directly on on their land, which would trigger something all over the world. So we don't really want to see that happen. It's like, Lord, hold that back. (laughs) There's a lot of prophetic things, though, that says, you know, we could be in that day. All the nations of the earth were gathered around Israel, it said, with hatred. And uh, that's in Zechariah. When you see that happening... All the, uh, you know, just everybody against Israel, then uh, something's about to happen. So, anyway, that's not my message today. Um, Before Emily spoke on revival last week, she had asked me to speak today, and I actually prepared a message on revival. (laughs) But, so she, I said, should I stay with that or? Do something else. She said, no, stay with what you felt in your heart. And so I am going to do that. And I actually had notes, but um, I kept feeling like 
Yeah, do you have that, that scripture? I sent it to Keith um, from Hosea. We'll put it up if you do. If not, I can get it on my phone. So, okay, we do. So I'll, I'll, I'll look, we'll look at it first. This is a New King James Version. It says, Come and let us return to the Lord, for He is torn, but He will heal us. He is stricken, but He will bind us up. After two days, He will revive us. On the third day, He will raise us up, that we may live in His sight. Let us know, let us Pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and the former rain to the earth. And that last verse actually in the Amplified is much more interesting. It says, let us know and become personally acquainted with him. Let us press on to know and understand fully the greatness of the Lord to honor, to heed, and to deeply cherish Him. His appearing is prepared and is as certain as the dawn. He will come to us in salvation like the heavy rain, like spring rain watering the earth. I think one of the reasons I lost my notes this morning is because I kept saying to myself, I may not get past this verse. And I may not. But I will, I will say this about revivals. Historically, revivals have been with us going all the way back into the Old Testament. You see, the nation of Israel, and, and of course, revival then meant to get back to keeping the law. That's not what it means today. I'll get to that. But it meant to get back to keeping the law and being the holy nation that God had appointed to be a an example to all the earth of his righteousness. But they had to do it through keeping the law. So they would keep the law for a while, then they begin to worship idols, and then they go far, far away from God, and then the prophets would begin to cry out and say, Lord, revive us. We're so far away from you. When it says here that, you know, he has torn us, but he'll heal us, he has wounded us, but he'll bandage us, what it's talking about is he basically pulled back his hand and let the enemies of Israel have them. And you, and the, you say today, people say, well, is America under judgment? I, I don't think God ever really judged any of the nations yet, since he's going to at the end of the age, in the last judgment. I don't think he's ever really judged any nations except for perhaps Sodom and Gomorrah and Nineveh later. Not when Jonah went to it, but later on, Nineveh, I guess, doesn't even exist anymore, really. And so, it's not really about judgment. Ruth uh, Graham, Billy Graham's wife, said before she passed away that she was on a, a, a news show and they asked her, do you think America is under judgment, God's judgment? She said, I don't know if that's the right question. He says, but let me say this. If there's a nation where, most of the pe- where many of the people are saying, God, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Leave us alone. Get away from us. Leave us alone. You think maybe after a while God would actually take them up on it? That was her take on the whole thing. And I would say in many ways God has pulled his hand back from our nation. For good reason. I'm not going to go into it all. You know it all already. All the terrible things that we're doing right in front of each other and in front of God that break His heart and do terrible things to each other, right? And so we're in a lot of trouble. And when Israel was in a lot of trouble, they would get on their face and they would cry out to God at the prophet's uh, request and declarations And God would then come in His Spirit, turn their hearts around, and they would return to the Lord, and they would begin to serve Him again with a whole heart and honor Him the way He should be honored. Throughout more modern history, 
We've had many revivals throughout history. And it's really interesting. A lot of people say, well, so revivals are just sovereign. God just sends them when he decides to. We don't have anything to do with it. But I don't really think that's true. <clears throat> if you look at all the historical revivals, I mean, God could do that, but he actually, <laughs> he actually chooses not to do it. He chooses not to do it. He wants to partner with us. And you'll see throughout history, going way back, you know, from the early church on, the greatest revival we've ever had was after the death and res resurrection of Jesus is the birth of the church with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that revival has actually never ended. It's the only vi revival in history that's never waned. Because you can find somewhere on earth the same thing happening and people coming to the Lord and the kingdom of God advancing and being extended. But there would be people in different nations, like I think of, I'll just kind of start with St. Patrick, who, you know, wasn't that long ago we had St. Patrick's Day. He was an amazing uh, intercessor and prayer warrior and would do things. He, he climbed up in a pole and stayed there and just prayed for days and days and days and didn't eat. You know, and there were people that tried to get him to be a part of their stuff, and he just had nothing to do with it. And so he was highly persecuted. But eventually he brought a massive revival to, to Ireland when God began to pour out his spirit. And what you see is, and I appreciate what you're saying last week, Emily, about us old guys. I mean, I do want to build with Jesus Pursuit Church the rest of my life. But I'll tell you the truth, most revivals were initiated through the young, not the old, starting with the, the first disciples and apostles. And I'll just say this to the younger generation, we can't win your generation to the Lord for you. You have to do it through your own faith and your own labor. We can't do it for you. We can help you and we can partner with you. We can support you in everything you're doing. We can... Uh, maybe be a good example to you, but we can't, we can't win your generation to the Lord. You have to do it for yourselves. Huh? No, I, I'm not saying you don't need us older folks. I'm trying to speak to the young now. It's like, if, if, what? Absolutely, it's your turn. It's your turn to have something ignited in your heart like Evan Roberts who got on his face for a year and said, God, give me a hundred souls lest I die. Day after day after day, he got on his face and he cried out to the Lord, give me a hundred souls lest I die, Lord. And all of a sudden in Wales, the Holy Spirit fell. And yeah, he was, he was the prominent person, no, the notable person preaching in that revival. And that's one of the problems with, with historical revivals today is that we get hung up on who's the agent of revival instead of the person who brings it, who is really God, in answer to that person. So whether it's a person or a group of people, like in the Hebrides Islands on the Isle of Lewis, First, there was two elderly women. One of them was practically blind. They cried out for, for God to send revival to the Isle of Lewis, and they had in mind that it was Duncan Campbell who was going to preach the message and going to come, and that revival was going to come to the Isle of Lewis. And they got on their face and they prayed, and then all of a sudden, in a little church in Barvis where Steve Schultz and I actually stayed just up the road in a, in a bed and breakfast up the road from this church, there were seven elders in that church, the Church of Scotland Free, that for about six or seven weeks went and prayed late into the night asking God to send revival to, to Barbas and to the Isle of Lewis. Why? Because they had had historical revivals that would come and go for years, and they've had practically nothing to do for the policemen. 
they would put peat moss out on the, on the edge of the house, where, which is what they used for fires, and nobody would ever steal it. But all of a sudden, people were in the bars, and people were stealing the peat moss, and things were going downhill. It wasn't anything like what we're seeing today, but to them, stealing peat moss was a horrible thing. These were righteous people. They cried out for six or seven weeks, and wouldn't you know, Duncan Campbell, who was not going to go to Barbas, he wasn't going to go to the Isle of Lewis. He was speaking at a major convention to leaders from all over England. And as he opened up his notes, the Lord spoke to him, and he had already had the invitation from the two elderly women. And he hadn't answered them, and he he was looking at his notes, and the Lord spoke to him and said, put your notes down and go to the Isle of Lewis and go to Barbas. He's like, well, no, I said, go to Barbas. You know, sometimes the Holy Spirit, all this stuff about the Holy Spirit is gentlemen. The Holy Spirit is a lover of our soul. But sometimes he can be very direct. He gave me a vision to go speak to Ralph Miller, the coach of Oregon State basketball team, my last quarter at OSU, and I was like, oh, that's crazy. I'm not going to do that. But I went fishing on the Alsea River during the break, my last quarter was coming up, and while I'm fishing, the Holy Spirit falls on me. He says, I want you to go speak to Ralph Miller. I want you to go to Gill Coliseum right now. It's like, Lord, there's the fish, there's this river's full of steelhead. (laughs) He's like, I said, I want you to go right now. I felt like, man, if I don't go right now, I'm in trouble. So I went, and I went right to Gill Coliseum to, uh, to the office of the basketball coaches and walk in, and I said, I'd like to speak to Coach Miller. He said, well, he's not here today. He's in the NCAA tournament. He'll be back tomorrow. Do you have an appointment with him? I said, yes. <laughs> I'll just leave the story, you know, at that. But I went back and I spoke to him. My, my point in that is sometimes the Holy Spirit has way more importunity about things than we do. And it's very possible that the importunity the Holy Spirit has toward revival right now is way more than what we do. Way more. Because of the state of the nation and the state of the world. Come, let us return in repentance to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. How does he wound us? How does he tear us? Sometimes by being very direct and telling us the truth. He doesn't make us sick. He doesn't, you know, I mean, does he lift his hand and let our enemies have us? Jesus even said this about forgiveness. If you don't forgive others, the Father will turn you over to the tormentors until you do it. I'm being pretty pretty direct today and pretty just, you know, we'll have the the dealer of hope here in June. (laughs) And I'm not trying to steal our hope. I'm just saying, I'll tell you something. The only thing worse than no hope is false hope. And if we put our hope in anything else but God to turn this thing around, It's a false hope. I don't care what that hope is, but if it's anything but all-out awakening and revival, we don't really have much chance in this nation to see things turn around. We desperately need to be revived. Revival means to live again. Revival means to get breath again, you know, be breathed on again. And to be raised up again. To rise up again. That's revival. I agree that busyness ends up 
becoming one of the biggest issues for us in revival, but that's because of another reason that precedes it. Excuse me for saying it, but it's called apathy. Who of us wants to admit that we're apathetic? I admit it. I admit it. I don't feel very proud of the way that I've handled the last several years and allowed the enemy to engage my mind and my emotions over all the darkness and everything that's creeping in. I'm not very proud of the way that I've handled it. Yeah, Chris. I, I can't hear you back here. Yes. Apathy is a lack of focus, a lack of passion and concern over things that we actually know we should have concern for. It's like if you see somebody, you know, Jesus had these parables. One of them was the Good Samaritan. You know, the, the, pre, the, the Pharisee passed by a guy all beat up on the street who'd been robbed. That's apathy. But then the Good Samaritan, a Samaritan, who were not looked on that favorably by the Jews, he didn't just pass by. He stopped to help the man. That's responding to concern with action. That's passion. That's a passionate response to a situation that greatly needed a passionate response. And he went way beyond. He said, I'll pay for anything this guy occurs for in the hotel and food and all of that. You know, after he put him up, made sure that he was going to get treatment for his wounds that he incurred being beat up. So anyway, I think that's pretty clear. So it's, revival is to live again, to have breath breathed on us. And we have not had a national revival that extended any period of time in this country since, since the outpouring of the Spirit in 1994. Something happened in Asbury College, I think about a year, year and a half ago, I don't know. And it didn't last, you know, it was... And it was, again, it was the young people. <laughs> the Jesus movement. There are plenty of older people who are impacted by the Jesus movement, but it was primarily tens of thousands of thousands in our country of young people coming to the Lord and the Holy Spirit falling on people. And there were agents like Lonnie Frisbee, and there were Asbury College was involved in that, and other uh, Notre Dame College, many colleges were involved in. We're seeing, we're seeing some good signs in that regard. There's actually many college campuses where hundreds of people are coming to the Lord and being baptized in water all around the country. That's actually happening. We don't get that kind of news in our news media. They don't care about stuff like that. But just to encourage you, it's actually happening. But we need something even greater than that because revival is not for the unsaved. It's for the church. It's for the believers. It was for Israel, and it's for the believers. And you see historically, and it's interesting, <clears throat> more agents that were used in revival. John Wesley, only 33 years old. Charles Finney, early 30s. Evan Roberts, early 20s. J uh, James Seymour, 30, early 30s. All of these people who were agents of revival and, uh, you know, initiated those moves of God through their prayers and through their obedience were young. And many of them went on to continue to serve the Lord and build movements for the rest of their life. Let us know and become personally acquainted with him 
let us press on to know and understand fully the greatness of the Lord, to honor, to heed, and deeply cherish Him. Wow. That kind of was what worship was about today. It's what Chris was getting at too. It's true that abiding is the key to, you know, letting our light shine and seeing the glory of God and all of that. But how do you how do you abide in the first place if you're apathetic and you're you've lost your passion? You return to the Lord. There are a lot of revivalists that nobody really knows their name that have got on their face and saw moves of God throughout the years too. And I'm not trying to be anything except real. I'm one of them. Starting with being baptized in the Holy Spirit and going to see people like Ralph Miller holding, with Ann, holding uh, house meetings, being a part of house meetings, to having a house church, and then being called into ministry, being obedient, and seeing God do incredible things out of Providence Vineyard. But I'll tell you, it wasn't that way in the beginning. I had a dream that I was supposed to go there, and I didn't really want to do it. There was only six families there. And a couple of them didn't want to have anything to do with Pentecostals or Charismatics. And so for the first couple of years, Dave and Teresa know this too. I mean, it was really dead. You know, we, we, didn't have, we didn't have worship like we have now. We didn't have any of those things for the first couple of years. It was hymns and a hymn leader, you know. And it was really hard, but I got on my face and I began to pray. I, I asked a few people to pray with me, but nobody was that interested to tell you the truth. I'm not bragging. It's like I had to, I had to do it out of desperation. It's like I answered this call. What am I going to do, quit? I don't even think there's a teaching job left for me. I'd have to go back to school at some point if I'm going to go back to teaching. So I'm telling you, I, just, I was being practical, if anything else. and got on my face and began to cry out to God in the office early in the morning. And then all of a sudden, it came to me to go to the most respected elder in our church, Dick Sapp, and say, look, if we drop Sunday morning, uh, Sunday school, before the church service, the Lord spoke to me and said he'd fill this place up. And he was the one leading the Sunday school. And at first he was not very happy about that. But he went and prayed. He was a man of God. He went and prayed. And he said, yeah, I think it's the Lord. So all these people started coming once we had, quote, children's church. But they were not non-Christians at this point. And we weren't really having any kind of outpouring. It was just people being drawn to us because we were a little different than what was out there and they were just satisfied with the church they were in. And we had all these leaders come from the Mennonite church, which was wonderful. But it really wasn't what was in my heart. And so I, again, praying again. And then all of a sudden, God begins to fall on us with healing and deliverance and salvations. And I know you guys know this is true, who are there. I mean, we had times, and Dave, we had a very small worship team. It wasn't anything like what we have now. But we just began to do worship, and demons would come out of people. It didn't happen all the time, but it did happen. And sometimes when I would get up to speak, it was really not like me. I would just be going through the book of Romans or something and somebody would show up 
like a girlfriend and her boyfriend. And he'd be so agitated because of the presence of God and the Holy Spirit that he'd be trying to get away and run away. <laughs> he didn't want to stay there. Little short gal Jackie kept jerking her boyfriend back down in his seat because he just couldn't stand what he was feeling. He knew his life was not right with God. Then we had another friend. I won't even mention it, another person who became a friend, came here for many years. But at that point, he was away from God and into drugs. He was so uh, under conviction, he couldn't even step in the church. And we had a move of God in that place and baptized a lot of people. But then I began to feel worn out. How many of you feel wore out? I mean, honestly, it happens. We had already planned to plant this church, but I felt wore out. So I got on my face again and began to pray and held on to prophetic words that had been spoken over our lives. All of us, not just me. And then Toronto broke out. It actually happened before that with Rodney Howard Brown up in Alaska, then down in Florida, then in Toronto. So I and Arlen Askew went and spent a week there, and when we came back, we prayed for the elders. Teresa was one of the few people who really got the touch of God when, we, when I prayed for people. Most of the guys were like, I don't feel anything. You know, and it was true of many people. I didn't feel anything up in Toronto for a week. But I didn't know that he would actually follow me home. Long story short, again, the, re the renewal, the outpouring of the Spirit in 94 broke out at Providence and ushered us into Albany into a tent. Many of you have heard this before in a theater, and we had weeks of meetings. People were saved. People were healed. People were filled with the Holy Spirit. Many people who were in churches who felt dead in their heart came alive again. It was revival. But that's a long time ago. <laughs> and that lasted actually for a long time here and a long time around the world, and people kind of criticize that move of God saying, well, there wasn't enough repentance or salvation. Uh, they didn't look deep enough. There was a lot of both. I mean, Heidi Baker and Roland Baker had about three churches in Mozambique, and that went to about 10,000 last year. So there was a lot more to it than what people knew. How many of you were touched by that outpouring and renewal. We still have a lot of people, so you remember. But that was good for then, but we need something now. Now, I'll tell you the thing that really touched my heart about this verse is that last part. It says, let us know and become personally acquainted with him and press on to know and understand fully the greatness of the Lord to honor, to heed, and deeply cherish him again. That's what we really need. That's what we need. It's not about, like Emily said last week, working harder. We need to come to a place in our hearts because New Testament revival is not about keeping the law. It's about fully giving your heart to God. It's about surrendering everything in your heart to God again. We have all done that at one time or another probably in this room. But I think we need to do it again. I'll tell you, this is why I couldn't get rid past this verse. I just don't think I've really honored the Lord in the last several years of my life. Just preparing a message and being faithful to my calling is one thing. The 
allowing my mind to be overwhelmed and my emotions to be overwhelmed by the darkness around us and missing the key, which is it's all for him. It's all for Jesus. It says in Romans, all things are from him, to him, and through him. That exist. Without him, we don't have anything. We may think we do, but without Jesus, we don't have anything. We may think we're something, somebody, or something, but without Jesus, we're really nothing. He gave us our life. And he gave us a chance at eternity, too, when he opened our heart to see the truth of the gospel. If the church is going to see revival in America again, it needs to honor Jesus more than anything else. We can't honor sports figures, politicians, whoever it may be, church figures. We can't honor anybody more than Jesus. He deserves all the glory. He's worthy of it all. Nobody else is worthy of it all. We might be worthy of some, but we're not worthy of it all. I believe he wants to come like heavy rain. Heavy rain. (laughs) Boy, living in Oregon, we know what that's like. Especially when it seems like the fall rains and the winter and spring rains all come at once. And they have a few times. That's heavy rain. That's a deluge you cannot ignore. (laughs) And that's what we need. We need, Holy Spirit, we need the heavy rain that we can't ignore. You, know, you all know how much I love to worship in song and love what we do here in worship. But I'll tell you truthfully, singing alone doesn't really cost us anything. True worship is honoring God wholly with your heart. Giving Him everything He deserves. I was so glad when The Passion of the Christ came out. It wasn't a feel-good movie. It was a movie that made you feel what Jesus did for you. That you could not ignore it. If you watched it, you couldn't do anything but weep And be broken with Jesus in your heart for what they did to him. And he did it all for us. I want to bring, I want to be in that place again, Lord. I want my heart to feel that again. That you are worthy of it all, and that my heart is soft and broken, not mad at this person or that, this thing or that thing fed up, discouraged, sarcastic, just over all the things that really bug me today as an old guy, because it wasn't that way when I grew up. I want to get past that, and I want to feel the touch of God again that breaks my heart to honor Him the way He really should be honored. I don't want to stay like this. I don't want the church to stay like this. We got great promises on us, but there's partnership. 
I don't know what the Lord requires of us in that partnership, but I'll tell you this, whatever it is, it must be worth it. Because without Him, we of all people have no hope. I didn't originate that saying. The Apostle Paul did. If He's not as real today as a risen Christ as He was when we said yes to Him and we're filled with His Holy Spirit, then we're just like the rest of people who have no hope. The resurrection of the dead is proof, positive, that there is something better for this world than what we've been looking at and what we've been feeling. Why don't you stand with me? I'm, I'm going to wrap it up. His appearance or appearing is prepared as certain as the dawn. And he will come to us in salvation like the heavy rain, like spring rain watering the earth. Lord, how we need you to come again. Holy Spirit, how we need you to come again. We can't take over those seven mountains. We can't do thus and so that we've been told that we should do. We can't do any of that stuff, Lord, unless you come again with heavy rain. Some people say revival is a passe idea. We should just go into all the spheres of influence and take them over and then everything will turn around. In fact, we actually had somebody in this place tell us if we didn't do it in six months, we were, we were, we were done for. How are we going to do that in six months? <laughs> we do need to do it, but we can't do it without him. It's not about a takeover. It's about being a light. Being salt. Jesus never called us to be ostriches. To hide our head in the sand, he called us to be light, to be seen by everyone. But I'll tell you what, I need some more voltage in my lamp, <laughs> some more oil. Holy Spirit, come again. Come again, Lord. Come again like heavy rain. So that we remember, Lord, what it's like to have you resting on us. To where we don't want to leave the meeting. We just want to stay and feel your touch, Lord. Your, your great love and just how great you are and honor you, Lord. and Praise you till we can't go. You know, they have no more voice. Because our worship is coming from a place of a broken and contrite heart that you will never despise. Lord, we're asking you to come again, Lord. And to be honest, I am so excited about going into the neighborhood and everything, but we need you to go with us, Lord. Lord, we need you to go with us. Otherwise, we just switch buildings. Come again, Holy Spirit. Come like heavy rain.
Lord, I had a renewed mind. I felt transformation, but I need a rewired mind. You never said there was any limit to how much our mind could be renewed. So there's no limit to how much we can be transformed. Oh, come again, Holy Spirit. I know this will end the recording, but I want you to play that song. Just remain standing, and this is not going to be recorded on YouTube.